Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Researching Early Detection of Ovarian and Endometrial Cancer Using High-Sensitivity Genomic Assays. My name is Mark Garner. I'm with Agilent Technologies, and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Uh, today's event is presented by Labrit, and it's brought to you by Agilent. We'd like to encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you have during the presentation. Uh, to do so, just type them in the Ask a que Question box and then click Send. We'll try and answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can also submit those in the same box. I'd like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Lucy Gilbert from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Department of Oncology at McGill, who's also the Director of the Gynecologic Cancer Service at McGill Health Center, and Dr. Yanis Ragusas, who's Head of Genome Sciences at McGill and uh, the Genome Quebec Innovation Center. Um, you, you know, today, especially just after ASCO, we know that early detection of cancer is so important. It, giving patients that can, the chance, getting it early. And I'm really excited with the presentation today because I think that really uh, addresses that question directly. So with that, uh, Dr. Gilbert, I'll turn it over to you to begin your presentation. Thank you for that presentation. I am Lucy Gilbert. I'm the Director of Gynecological Oncologist, uh, Gynecologic Oncology at McGill University Health Center. I'm extremely uh, pleased to be doing this presentation. It's on a genomic path test for the early detection of ovarian and endometrial cancer. It's still in its research uh, phase. I'm pleased to say that we are in quite a late stage of research and development. And I'm grateful to all our supporters and funders for helping us get to this stage. So what I shall cover today is the clinical aspects, because I am predominantly a clinician. What is Dub gene? Why do we need it? Where are we at now and how did we get here? What are the ongoing challenges? And, I, and then I'll pass it over to Professor Ragusas, who, who will take over and cover the technical aspects of the study. So I did mention that I'm extremely grateful to all, all our funders and supporters who have brought us to this stage. So what is Dub gene? It stands for detecting ovarian and endometrial cancer early using genomics. It is an intrauterine pap test. Now, for those of you who are not too familiar with gynecological cancers, I have this diagram here, which shows the uterus. Inside the uterus, you have a lining, and that's called the endometrium. We have the tubes, we have the ovaries. The, what I will be concentrating on today is cancers that arise in the endometrium, which is the lining, and what we refer to as ovarian cancer. But ovarian cancer includes fallopian tube cancer and what we have come to call primary peritoneal cancer. But I'll elaborate on this a bit later. Why is this important? It's important on two levels. On the individual level, it causes great suffering and loss. It affects mothers, sisters, daughters, wives, friends. But if we move back from the individual level and look at it from a societal point of view, it's also a very big deal. In the US, and this applies not just to the US, but to most high income countries, of the 90 or so cancers affecting women, ovarian and endometrial cancers rank third for 
the incident cancers, that is numbers of women affected for cancer related death and for healthcare costs. So, so it does need our attention. So here are the numbers. So here you can see that in terms of incident cases, numbers of women affected breast uh, cancer leads with 26,268,600 uh, cases. But in terms of um, deaths, the mortality rate We've made such good advances with breast cancer that the mortality rate is only 16%. It's still too many, but 16%. Now compare that with lung cancer. It has a very high case fatality ratio, and so too does ovarian and endometrial cancers. Now the bottom uh, uh, table shows uh, a split between the ovarian and uterine cancer. You can say that here ovarian cancer trumps even lung cancer, that the mortality rate is very high, 62%. And, and why is this so? It is so because of one reason, and that is late stage diagnosis. So, if you look at ovarian and endometrial cancer, they are really not one single entity. It's a mixed bunch of many different types, but you can forget almost all the other types and remember one type, and that is the high-grade serous cancer. High-grade serous cancer of the ovary happens to be the most common type. It accounts for most of the deaths and Unfortunately, it's such a bad actor because most cases, more than 85% are diagnosed in stage 3 and 4. And the 10-year survival is about 20 to 30%. We used to present 5-year survivals, but we have invested so heavily on the treatment of these cancers that you can get women to live, can push the survival to from we started with three years and it got, went on to four years five years now we can get them to live a little longer but invariably they succumb to it so now we talk about 10 year survival rates and that hasn't budged for over three decades now with high grade serous cancer of the endometrium it's much much rarer most forms of endometrial cancers are the nicer types but despite this being rare, it accounts for most of the deaths from endometrial cancer, which means it's as vicious. And it's vicious because most of it is diagnosed in late stages, and the 10-year survivals are really very bad for this type too. So um, it, as I said, the cure rates haven't changed in 30 years for both these cancers, and that's because of late diagnosis. Now, with any solid tumors, if you detect it while it's confined to the organ, the prognosis is excellent. So if we detect high-grade uh, ovarian and endometrial cancer while it's confined to the gynecological organs, we can cure this by surgery and if necessary, by adjuvant chemotherapy, one shot, and the women remain disease-free. However, only 10% of women are detected in early stages. On your uh, right, you see that more than 85% of ovarian cancers, high-grade serous ovarian cancers are detected after it has uh, uh, spread to vital organs, the bowel, liver, lungs, neck nodes, and once it spread to this uh, uh, effect, all the, it, once it affects all these organs, you can't really do surgery to remove all of these. So you remove what you can, and then you are in uh, tr just con trying to contain the disease. Uh, this is something that uh, Leyland Hartwell, who 
who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology in 2001 said, he used to be the president um, of the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Center in uh, Seattle. It costs a billion dollars to funnel a single cancer medication through the regulatory pipeline. For a fraction of that, new diagnostics to spot cancers in their early stages ultimately save more lives. And this is what we are do trying to do with this early detection test. So what is it that we have now? Really next to nothing. For years we uh, uh, tried to figure out and work on whether ultrasound imaging of the ovaries and a blood tumor marker called CA125 would help early detection. And really many, many trials, including one of the largest randomized control trials uh, called the UKC TOX. Um, persisted with this for over 15 years and uh, the final publication was just this month in, in the Lancet. It showed that these tests do not work as screening tests. Do they work in the symptomatic patients? And we at Megill invested in this in, in, two, in, 20, two, in 2008. We ran a trial offering this um, free at the uh, free of charge, quick access to anybody who had the slightest, slightest symptoms. And we found that even when we cast the net wide, even when we made it easily available, we were unable to detect the disease in stage one. We did find it in. Um, in a more respectable stage than if we allowed patients to t go through the usual route. But it still was not good enough to pick it up in stage one. And, and, and what our uh, study showed, the DOVE project, and again, DOVE stands for detecting ovarian and endometrial cancer early. And to refresh your memory, we were using CA125 and endovag ultrasound scan. And what we found is the reason why these tests don't work. And that is when we first realized that ovarian cancer is not really ovarian cancer. About 70% of ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tube. On your right, you see a close-up of the ovary and the fallopian tube. The ovary is this pearly white structure you see there. And the fallopian tube is this beautiful, delicate, pinky uh, structure that you see next to the ovary. So the vast majority of high-grade serous ovarian cancer does not start in the ovary, but starts in this delicate, pinky structure, the fallopian tube. And from here, it sprays like aerosol. The cells exfoliate, and it's wafted all over the peritoneal cavity and it's stuck under the diaphragm. The lower figure on your right is, you see the top of the liver and the undersurface of the diaphragm. And while the ovary, the poor ovary still looks beautiful and normal, the cells from the cancer cells from the fallopian tube have already dislodged and got un under on the surface of the liver and undersurface of the diaphragm. So now you can understand why just looking at the ovary with imaging was, was missing these cancers. So, so now that we uh, realize that we are barking the wrong tree with looking at the ovary, we tried to look for other means of detecting this cancer early. And one of the wonderful success stories in uh, the history of medicine and in gynecological cancers is the PAP test for the detection of ovarian cancer. On this graph, you can see that the PAP test, when it was introduced in about the 1960s, the difference it made to the incidence of cervical cancer and the death rates from cervical cancer. It, you can see it's been steadily falling since then. 
And I believe in the next 10 years, it will almost be non-existent, just as we got rid of a small pox and to a large extent, uh, things like polio. So, and the reason it's been so successful is we can pick it up in the pre-cancer stage when it can be treated easily. So in countries where the PAP test is universally available, free at the point of access, cervical cancer is not a problem. In Canada, it's now only the 15th cause of death in Canadian women. It used to be the second high, uh, cause of death. <clears throat> now, so, so the pap test, this on your left, you see a cervix, and the pap test involves uh, uh, scraping the surface of the cells, a uh, surface of the cervix, and putting it on a slide. And the cytopathologist must look for the cancer cells in these slides. Now, this is not going to work. Uh, a cytology-based test, we did, uh, many people did look into this, it's not going to work for the early detection of ovarian uh, cancer, nor for that matter for endometrial cancer. Why? Because only a tiny, you saw how easily the uh, cells spread from the fallopian tube all into the abdomen. So to pick it up early, you must pick it up while the cancer is tiny and microscopic. And what we know about the fallopian tube is its reason to exist is to grab things from the ovary and push it into the uterus, the eggs, for example. So, so if we follow its physiological role, it, if there are cancer cells, the first place it will find its way into is into the uterine cavity from the fallopian tube. So if you collect something from inside the uterine cavity and you have a very high sensitive, sensitivity test, not a crude test looking for the whole cell on a, on a slide, but a very high sensitivity assay, this would work for early detection of ovarian and endometrial cancer. And once this idea occurred to uh, me, I joined forces with Dr. Vogelstein from um, the Johns Hopkins, and we evaluated liquid biopsies from the cervix, from inside the uterus, as well as the blood, for to see if we could leverage it for the early detection of ovarian and endometrial cancer. And we published this in Science Translational Medicine in 2018. And we established that, yes, looking for cancer fragments of cancer DNA in liquid biopsies is, uh, uh, by doing this, it is possible to detect these cancers early. And we also established that the best method for detecting early cancers was not uh, a cervical pap test, but going into the uterus, going closer to the source of the cancer. And for very early, for stage three, a combination of blood and cervical pap test was enough. But for very, for the really early stages, you needed an endometrial or intrauterine pap smear. So having established this, we then tried to improve on the genomic PAP test. And, uh, and the problem with the uh, study we had published in, the science, uh, in, the, uh, in science translational medicine was the control group we used were healthy young women. Now, unfortunately, if you're going to offer a screening test to the population at large, you have to choose the population at risk. And it is women over 45 who have more than 90% of uterine and endometrial cancer. And in this population, un unfortunately, there's a high background rate of somatic mutations. And this population also has a high um, 
prevalence of benign diseases like fibroids, endometriosis, and these conditions are also associated with uh, somatic driver mutation. So the problem then is to differentiate benign disease, uh, no, cancers from benign disease and age-related mutations. So we introduced a new, in the, um, uh, the work we did with Johns Hopkins, we had used a binary uh, uh, classification, which is, you know, presence of mutation, no mutations. But here, we, uh, in the new phase, what we did was introduce machine learning to differentiate cancers from benign disease and age-related mutations. We also tried to improve on the gene panel and and in, tried to improve our detection rates for TP53. We introduced um, the, um, uh, the BRCA genes and looked for uh, genes which were associated with mismatch repair. Now, the other thing is you can have a super duper fantastic result, a uh, fantastic test, but if it's difficult for women in uh, if women do not uh, take take up these tests easily if it's difficult for doctors to provide this then your detection rate is not going to be uh, good so we also took it, this into consideration because the potential number of women we have to uh, offer this to would be very very high close to about 48 million women um, uh, are potentially eligible. And if you say you're going to offer this test every two to three years, that's, that is uh, still a significant number of women. So we worked on c coming up with an assay that would be in the public domain, that would lend itself to automation and high throughput testing. It would be easy on women and easy for healthcare providers. So we worked not just on the assay, but also on a device that would be uh, allow us to collect the liquid biopsies very, very easily. And this is a tiny little beautiful device that we've come up with, which uh, would go into the uterus and pick up the cells without dislodging too many of the normal cells. And we also worked on a buffer that would be stable at room temperature, and um, one does not have to go to, uh, uh, jump through hoops to ensure that it reaches a central lab very soon. So, goes into the, it's very tiny, and it goes into. Uh, the uterus and collects uh, the cells easily. Doctor, uh, Professor Ragusis is going to go into details of this. And again, I remind you, it's still in the development phase. It's only a research study uh, still. But we were able in the final phase of uh, phase 2B uh, uh, by offering it to 402 women in the context of a study, we were able to get a detection rate of 70% with a specificity of 100%. And we are now offering this in the context of a stage uh, phase 3 prospective clinical trial to women in uh, between the age of 45 and 70 in Montreal. We are able to do this because we were fortunate to receive a, a, a genomic applied partnership grant from Genome Canada and Genome Quebec, and our hospital foundation has also um, uh, come in uh, and partnered with us to develop this test. And we are very, very excited. We started offering it to women two, two, uh, two weeks ago, and we've already enrolled about 60 women. So we expect um, this uh, 
trial to finish quite fast. We intend to recruit at least 3,600 women between the age of 45 and 70, and we hope to convert it from a, a research test to a clinical uh, a grade test. So, Um, this is for uh, people who want to, uh, uh, or rather potential patients who want, patients or women who want to access the test. So um, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'm, I shall hand over to Professor Yanis, uh, who will tell you more about the technological aspects of this assay. Um, and um, and then I'll be able to answer any questions. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. Take care. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, I will now focus on the DNA assay technology part of the presentation. I am Yanis Ragusis. Uh, from the Department of Human Genetics at McGill University and Head of Genome Sciences at the McGill Genome Center. The development of this assay uh, includes now several components. One is the collection of samples from the uterus of the patient, as well as a matching saliva sample. And these two samples are used for DNA extraction um, by applying a GEMAGIC fully automated system, uh, Elmer. And then the DNA extracted uh, is used for panel sequencing, uh, in this example, using Haloplex uh, HS from Argemen, with the aim of A, detecting germline mutations in the gene panel, as well as somatic mutations which are then also annotated uh, in terms of uh, impact uh, and uh, pathogenicity. Further information that is collected is the age of the patient and the data are used for uh, developing uh, different tools that are make use of machine learning to create a, a classifier. And the classifier has a binary output. Uh, either the sample would be positive for cancer or negative for cancer. Um, this information uh, is generated and it's also put into the context of uh, germline variants that are detected. Again, this could be positive for variants that are linked uh, to hereditary risk for these cancers or uh, no risk. So all these three types of information uh, are generated using the assay. Now, the data I'm going to present uh, are from samples collected in the phase two clinical trial using this assay. And it can be separated in two phases. And the main reason for separating them is the further development and iteration of the assay that is being used. Um, at this point, I just want to mention that in the first phase, uh, 290 patients were enrolled. In the second phase, there were 733 of them, uh, which allowed for the analysis of 402 uh, patient uh, uh, sample combinations and as well as uh, 182 from the first um, part of phase two. Now, the panel that we are using contains originally 18 genes linked to endometrial and ovarian cancers, uh, genes like uh, obviously TPC3, P10, uh, but also the full uh, gene sequence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 to detect uh, variants that could predispose to the disease, um, as well as KRAS and then MLH1 and MSH2. In the second uh, part, so phase 2B, we included also the full length sequence of ARID1A to the panel, as well as 
uh, hotspot regions from the genes EGFR, TOL-E, LOPK1, and BRAF. Overall, we are capturing uh, now uh, 181 uh, kilobases in uh, 5,477 amplicons. The other thing that we have added is uh, assays for 48 zip, so that's part of the captures that allow us to unambiguously distinguish between two different samples in order to identify any potential mix-up or mis misalignment between germline results versus uh, uterine sample results. So the technology that is used had to fulfill the following uh, requirements. It has to be uh, in, a public, uh, in a public domain. It should be automatable um, through standard operation, operating procedures and transferable to medium-sized lab, but also scalable and flexible to include or eliminate uh, genes, uh, as well as uh, enable germline variant screening and the inclusion of polymorphic SNPs in order to unambiguously assign germline to more type sample pairs. Now, um, here is a graphical representation of the Haloplex HIC assay we applied originally. It required an input between 50 and 70 nanograms and is being used to um, capture uh, amplicons that are generated through uh, one step, which includes enzymatic digestion of DNA, hybridization to probes, and then capturing of uh, uniquely barcoded targets, and followed by PCR amplification. We have published this method originally a few years ago in, um, in its application in high sensitivity sequencing in the general medical genetics. Now, the idea behind the unique molecular barcode is the following, that you take the reads, you align them, and you group the reads uh, according to the molecular barcode information. So reads with the identical molecular barcode are grouped together, and then the information uh, from these reads of, with the same uh, molecular barcode is consolidated uh, to one read. And this, it is this consolidation that leads to um, increasing the accuracy, accuracy at which we can detect true variants. Uh, and as you can see here on the right side of the picture, random errors are expected not to be present within each sequence, within each read while uh, true variants origi you know, originating from the original DNA molecule are expected to be present in all the leads. So there is a filtering process that allows us to increase the accuracy. Now the other thing we do is, and here is a presentation of how we uh, perform downstream filtering of the data is that you, know, you can see here uh, in green on the top side of the picture, the different amplicons that are being captured using the Haloplex HF. The initial reads in the middle, uh, then these are grouped according to the barcode, uh, and then be duplicated to generate consensus reads. So if we have uh, a read that has only one barcode, and it doesn't, it doesn't appear again. If, it, if this barcode is, does not appear again, it is removed, as well as uh, reads with low quality barcode sequence are also being removed. The other thing that we do is because we are capturing these amplicons in both directions through separate capture assays, uh, we also want to include in our analysis uh, read sequence information from both strands. So you can see on the, on the top in the green box, 
that we have read that go in both directions, while if you have at least one antisense amplicon captured, while in the case where there is no sense and antisense uh, sequence information present, the data are removed from the analysis. The other thing that we look for as uh, a quality control of the whole design is that there's homogeneous coverage of the gene when we sequence deeply. Uh, and you can see here data derived from all genes that we had included in the assay and uh, what is the depth and median coverage that uh, we achieved. And you can see that for the majority of the genes, apart from the answer, with one exception on the right, with mark one, we, we have a quite comparable uh, median coverage. Uh, and in this case, we aim to be you know, within 1,000 and 5,000 X. Now, what was the result? First of all, we did detect germline variants. So what uh, you can see here is indeed many of the samples did have uh, BRCA1 uh, and BRCA2 uh, variants, which um, had predicted high um, impact, with predicted high impact uh, severity. You can see that uh, many of them were stopped gain, gain mutations, deemed to be pathogenic uh, in clean bark with pathogenic clean bar annotation. So this was quite exciting actually to be able to detect those mutations. But we didn't detect mutations in BSCA1 and BSCA2 or of pathogenic variants in BSCA1 and BSCA2, but also in uh, as shown here MLH1 and MLH2 uh, that also justified the inclusion of the full sequence of these genes. So this was one part. So we did detect uh, germline variants uh, that uh, could increase the risk of developing cancers. What did we get in terms of somatic variants from the intrauterine brush derived samples? So here is a waterfall plot whereby we line up from top to bottom, uh, the genes that had most mutations versus the genes that had less mutations detected in all the samples, and the different types of uh, cancer samples so are uh, lined up from left to right. So in dark blue are on the left side and representing the majority of our cases are the endometrial cancers followed by the ovarian cancers in orange in the middle, but also a significant number of different benign conditions dark purple on the right. What did we detect? We detect mutations for the majority of the samples, um, particularly if these were from the endometrial cancers, as you can see here, um, most of them led to the detection of mutations. And underneath the uh, tumor type, you can see the variant allele frequencies. Uh, so basically, the endometrial cancers had a median variant allele frequency of above 10%, meaning eventually 10% of the sample did include uh, cells derived from endometrial cancer. While in the ovarian cancers, orange dot um, in the middle of the, of the plot. Uh, as you can see, they, we also detect mutations there, but uh, these were at much lower allele frequencies at the level of approximately 1% or slightly higher. Now, in the benign conditions, we do detect mutations in roughly half uh, of these, as you can see here on the right part of the figure. But these were also low allele frequency one, and the median was less than 1%. Uh, it was lower 
in ovarian cancers. So you could see a, you know, an, a, a drop in ovarian release frequencies uh, and associated uh, content of cancer cells um, potentially in these samples from endometrial to ovarian and then to be nine. Uh, More or less the same is true for the number of mutations per sample. We have samples giving us many mutations in endometrial then less in you know less so in ovarian cancer and even less so in the I have also included here uh, the stages of the disease that was diagnosed uh, as well and uh, what you can see is that we are quite good actually uh, in the green in, in, in detecting um, early stage degree uh, disease, which is uh, quite important. Uh, both for uh, low and high grade uh, tumors. Now, this information uh, is then used into machine learning to develop a classifier. So what do we do next? And this is work done by Lai Yang, a student of Professor Celia Greenwood at McGill University, who is an expert in this field. Uh, and we were very lucky to work with her. Um, the information of variant allele frequency and annotation or functional annotation of the mutations using CAD, using Polyphen, and using GERD, meaning that we include information uh, related to uh, con sequence conservation in the particular position, the effect on the amino acid sequence and predicted protein structure, as well as other functional uh, annotations is integrated. And the interaction between these annotations and the variant of frequencies is also shown uh, here. So this is also calculated, as well as the number of mutations. So this information all goes into developing um, a prediction tool. And what we can see is that indeed, when this type of information is combined, as you can see in this graph, whereby we include information related to the variant allele frequency, which is on the uh, y-axis, uh, the GERP score, so the functional annotation severity on the z-axis, and then the interaction between these two on the x-axis, so it's a three-dimensional uh, picture, I hope you can see it. What was important is the R classifier uh, classifies as cancer samples uh, in, in dark, uh, while samples are classified as normal uh, when the, the color is light. And what you can see is actually is that if if a sample uh, results in the you know if we detect uh, mutations at high allele frequencies, um, top right corner of the graph. Uh, for example, uh, this plays a key role, as well as whether it has a high uh, GERD score. While samples that have low allele frequencies and low GERD scores at the bottom right corner um, are classified as normal. And then it is a matter of um, looking at what threshold of uh, a score from uh, is shown here as 0 0.3 to 1 is being applied to differentiate between cancer and normal samples. If we apply that and we use the score of 0 0.8 in this case to see whether it is possible to distinguish uh, between cancer samples and benign conditions, you can see here that indeed with uh, at the score of our prediction tool of 0 0.8, we can actually identify uh, cancer samples. Only in the benign conditions shown as green bars uh, are 
excluded um, because we produce uh, no prediction scores that are lower than 0 0.8 in this case. So this that gave, gave us hope that actually using this method and the combination, the, the information that we can derive from this assay, uh, that there is a chance to distinguish uh, benign conditions and uh, cancers. Now, overall, uh, we detected using this particular assay, we detected one or more somatic mutations in 84% of all the cases uh, with cancer versus 45% of the controls. And the sensitivity at high specificity uh, of 100, if we want a specificity for 100%, we could say that if it's possible to have a sensitivity of about 70%, um, whereby for early stage uh, it could be 81% and late stage 58% using the data that we have produced. Now we haven't stopped here. This was the, the first step, and this is work in progress. So what we did next is to try and increase the sensitivity uh, of our assay. And we could increase the sensitivity of our assay by increasing the accuracy at which we can sequence and the depth at, this, at which we can sequence. And for this reason, we, we decided to uh, apply uh, sequencing technologies that would be more sensitive. And these were first pioneered, for example, by Jesse Salt um, as duplex sequencing, which means that uh, if we apply this approach that uh, contains basically a more complex, unique, unique molecular barcode system, uh, if you can see here, a DNA fragment at the top, uh, you, you note that there is a, a group of barcodes called alpha on the left and beta on the right. And depending on which strand you are sequencing, you will either have a combination, if you have alpha, with a combination of one, so the purple or the green, followed in, in the beta, so the right side of the DNA fragment, if you, as you see, of either now um, green or purple. So by sorting now the sequences according to the combination of barcodes they have in conjunction with the alpha or beta barcodes, you, you can um, sort them according to whether they belong to the top strand or the bottom strand. What is important here in, in contrast to the complex assay, where we also look for sequences uh, coming from the top or the bottom strand, in the complex assay, this could be, or this would be, two different uh, DNA molecules. While here, uh, we are sequencing the same DNA molecule, whereby we can obtain the sequence from both of each strand and check whether uh, the mutation we find is present on both strands of the same initial DNA molecule. Uh, the rest of the, uh, the data analysis is very similar to what I've shown before, before by building up consensus, but this time the consensus sequence comes from a combination of top strand and bottom strand sequence. Now, we applied for this the Algin and Sure Select uh, uh, XP HS uh, version. And there were several reasons for working with Algin on this. Um, one is that we could apply duplex type sequencing uh, barcoding system, as I've shown before. But also, as shown here, we wanted to have a library preparation method whereby we can also use the, uh, the generated libraries for whole genome sequencing. Um, and this is done by taking an aliquot of the initial library preparation phase, uh, as shown here before the probes are captured, as, it, you, know, as you know, very, very similar to 
exome or final sequencing using uh, a variety of different vendors. But what is important here is that we use the initial uh, library that is generated uh, containing uh, fragments to, from the entire genome of the sample to perform low pass or even higher pass whole genome sequencing. So we split basically the, uh, the workflow into a whole genome sequencing part and a panel sequencing part that is following. And input is again very low, so uh, it's comparable to Haloplex, so we use 55 nanograms of DNA. The analysis is very similar to what I've shown for Halplex. Basically, the read, uh, the read pairs, but this time there are four read pairs. The a library molecule, uh, these are aligned according to position and then sorted according to in index structure. And then um, once they have been sorted in a time specific way, uh, the consensus sequence is generated and filtered for um, mutations that are uh, present uh, or assumed to be present in the original DNA molecule. So our aim was to sequence a 0.1 to 1x coverage um, in this case, uh, which is, represents uh, something like 0.323 gigabase per of data, while for our panel sequencing, because we want to sequence very deep we produce about 12 gigabase per, per data per sample to have a theoretical coverage of 71,000 X. Um, and we use an estimated 15,000 genomes uh, to achieve that as input. And what you can see is that indeed this can work. So using the low pass sequencing, we can uh, detect as in this case, deletions all over the genome with green. Um, the blue dots are normal and the red dots above are local uh, amplifications that we can detect. And we can detect this as just over you know, at about one X coverage uh, as well as 0.1 X coverage. This of course will depend on the proportion of the cells in the sample that are derived from cancer. But what we want to achieve is even at low proportions, we want to make sure that we will not miss uh, the detection of copying other abnormalities uh, if there are you know, enough uh, cancer cells uh, present in the sample in case we did not detect a mutation uh, in the genes of our panel. And that seems to work very well. This is an initial assessment of the source select assay. Um, again, it's a, one, it's a waterfall plot with uh, a number of samples that we use to detect mutations. And indeed, there's great concordance between um, haloplex data and source select data derived from the same sample, whereby, uh, and this is signified in a cross, whereby if you look carefully, there are many, uh, or quite a number of somatic mutations that are detected uh, through the short select assay. So indeed, we have increased the number of mutations we can detect. What is particularly pleasing is that when we detect the same mutation, which is in most of the cases um, for both samples, for both, for, for both captures from the same sample, there's a very good concordance uh, of allele frequency um, between the short select captures and the haloplex captures, as you can see on the left, even if we go to uh, a very high allele frequency range of less than 0 0.01 uh, percent. Uh, again, we do have very good concordance between uh, the two assays using the same sample. So that gives us very good confidence that we can use the short select now assay to replace the haloplex assay and detect the low frequency variants. And indeed, uh, as shown here, 
we use this, we, we increase the number of genes that we are um, detecting, for example, to include genes like RF1, RB1, RX5B, um, and so on. And therefore, now we are detecting even more mutations per sample um, in both um, endometrial cancers and ovarian cancers. And what was particularly pleasing is that we are detecting now uh, more mutations in the ovarian cancers than before. We still detect mutations in the benign conditions. And what we do now is we also look and we integrate um, the copy number information. As you can see here, in pink or, or lighter or darker uh, pink, you, we, we see abnormalities in the ploidy, and we can also detect uh, the potential tumor fraction. Uh, below at the bottom of the graph are the allele frequencies. And, uh, these are again highest uh, in the endometrial cancer cases. Uh, lower in the ovarian cancer and lower in the benign. And what we are trying to do at the moment is to combine the mutation detection information, as you can see here in the waterfall plot, the first uh, part, the part above, uh, for all types of conditions with uh, the copy number information that you can see at the bottom, which we can classify, you know as copy neutral gain, amplification, or deletion. And this information is now being used to develop new classifiers uh, to distinguish between benign and cancerous conditions. Finally, what is the challenge that still remains? It is, it is the challenge that we had from uh, the beginning, which is that the the, the benign conditions also contain mutations. Um, thankfully, this, a, a, a very comprehensive paper was published uh, out of the Sanger Institute uh, last year by Moore et al., which looked at, uh, we did a very thorough study to look at uh, mutations that can arise in normal endothelium, endometrium, and how this compares to endometrial carcinoma uh, or serous carcinoma. And what you can see, indeed, yes, there are mutations that are detected, um, and, but the profiles are somewhat different, as we can see here. So what we are looking at at the moment is to, to utilize this information to increase um, the success of our classifier. But at least we know that we can expect if the assay works well, we should be able to detect these mutations in uh, normal or benign conditions, and our data uh, agree with that. So to conclude, the high sensitivity sequencing using this assay allows indeed the detection of very low frequency mutations in a uterine brush samples. It allows the detection of endometrial cancers at an early stage, in particular. Um, the application of the SUSELF HT assay uh, in HS form, uh, in combination with low pass whole genome sequencing, does increase the sensitivity of somatic detection. Um, and that includes ovarian cancer cases, so we are very excited about that. Um, indeed, we can confirm that somatic mutations are also detected in benign conditions, and this has to be interpreted. So our current work focuses on differentiating between benign conditions and ovarian cancer in particular, uh, using a combination of all the tools that I have uh, described above, uh, both mutation detection, functional notation, and copy number analysis. I finish by thanking my lab, uh, and in particular, Corinne Garmont, Melissa Zweig, Imara Akbar, Fatih Al-Kayal, Seto Ramuzo, and Tim Reville, as well as, and particularly Tim, who did a lot of work in establishing our bioinformatics analysis pipeline, but also see Professor Celia Greenwood and Lai Jiang, who developed the, uh, the prediction tools. Thank you. And, uh, the presentation is now open for questions.
Great. Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Pragusis, thanks very much. Those were fantastic presentations. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in. We won't have time for all of them, I can tell now. But actually, uh, just maybe to start with one, which would, I think, probably go to both of you, and that is, how do you balance sensitivity versus specificity in the W test? Uh, can I uh, go? Yes, can you yes, please, Lucy, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is really the challenge because we do know that we can increase the sensitivity almost up to uh, 90, 95 percent, but then uh, the specificity uh, would uh, be poor. Um, and the problem with any test which we cannot corroborate. Uh, so uh, for example, if you take something like a mammogram, uh, it doesn't matter if the specificity is low, because if you have a lump in the breast, you can always do a biopsy. Uh, of course, uh, nobody likes the biopsy, but at least you don't have to take the breast off. You can do, do, you can do a biopsy. So. With, te with a test in which you can corroborate without a, a terribly dangerous procedure, it doesn't matter if the specificity is not very high. In the DAB gene test, because uh, the only way to corroborate a, a, a positive uh, finding would be to major surgery to remove the uterus tubes and ovaries. That's why we we have a very hard task uh, ahead of us, and we have to set the specificity at almost 100%. That is why we were prepared to accept a lower sensitivity. So, so, so the uh, to answer your question, it depends on the site and what is available to corroborate a positive result. So in something in which major surgery is needed, we have to set the sense of specificity very, very high. So we will not tolerate uh, even a 1% false positive. I hope that answered your question. Yes, I think that was that was uh, a, a great uh, great response. And yes, it's always a balance, isn't it? It's uh, yes. th there is no bright line. Um, and then to continue on that theme, uh, how do you see the test developing in order to increase both the accuracy and sensitivity? So, um, so here we have you know, almost walking on a tight rope, a, a tight rope. So we do not want to uh, give people a false uh, positive test and then subject them to major surgery. So we've set the se uh, specificity at almost near 100%. But equally, we do not want to tell somebody, uh, we don't think you have a cancer, and then six months later, they're diagnosed with a cancer. So what we've done is we are not compromising on the specificity, but then we are working extremely hard to improve the sensitivity. So uh, we believe that we've got very high sensitivity for endometrial cancer, but we are continuing to improve the assay by uh, picking up uh, P50, uh, TP53 mutations. We are introducing uh, uh, copy number changes to increase the sensitivity for high-grade serous ovarian cancer, which really is our nemesis. Okay. Great. And then a question came in, and I think this would be for Dr. Ragusis, about whether you used a consensus reference genome and how that was derived, and then follow-on question there on uh, sequence depth that you would recommend. Yes. we we. Good question. So we did use the we do use the reference genome, and in this particular case, we use AG19 uh, or GRC37. So because these are the versions that are being used by uh, Agilent to generate the design 
uh, for the assays we are using. So yes, it is the, the reference genome that you can uh, find in the University of Santa Cruz uh, genome browser, for example. In terms of depth of sequence, uh, as shown, we can we have gone down to 71,000 sort of reads per base coverage. Uh, the recommendation is to seek at least 1,000 fold net coverage. Um, but this really depends on uh, the type of assay that is being used. Uh, I don't think we have fully uh, exploited the potential of the source select XPHS. Uh, but we are, I think we are quite close uh, to that, but at the moment we use 70,000 fold uh, coverage of the genome uh, that allows us to detect um, about 0.05% uh, variant allele frequencies. Okay, great. Thanks for that. And uh, then an additional um, uh, uh, follow-up question which that uh, listener had is, uh, what the percent cutoff of uh, for your BAF is in the pipeline and on turnaround time from sample to a report. The, the cutoff point at the moment is at 0 0.05, uh, but we are working uh, towards um, decreasing that even further. Uh, our aim of turnaround time is three weeks. It really depends on uh, the number of samples that are being used and um, the, the reporting structure that is being put in place. But our aim is a, a three week turnaround time. It can be done faster even, but this is what we are aiming for at this point. Okay. Great, and I think um, uh, another question came in that uh, if I can um, uh, sort of compress a little bit, uh, it's a great presentation. Basically, um, are you looking at any altered mRNA expression levels? I, I, I don't think I'm distorting that question by uh, condensing it down to that. Um, the, what we do is, uh, you know, looking at the question, Yes, we do, uh, as shown uh, at the end, towards the end of the presentation, uh, we are working towards incorporating copy number uh, alterations into our uh, assay. So yes, we do look now at copy number uh, alterations and feed that into um, the assay development. So RNA expression, we are not doing because this would be a completely different assay. Um, it may be possible to do that, but at the moment, for due to the assay design, uh, the assay is based on DNA in order to be able to obtain germline, uh, the full germline sequence of the genes that we want to interrogate uh, and look for germline variants independent of the levels of gene expression in the tissue that is being sampled. Okay, great. And then maybe one final question um, on uh, the genes in your panel. Why not include all hereditary ovarian cancer genes in the panel? Okay. It's another, uh, okay, good question. We Theoretically, we could have included all of them. Um, they are obviously, the, the more you include, the, the returns are diminishing. Uh, what we try to do is to keep uh, some of the most important genes, like BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, and fully sequence those for any predisposing variants. Uh, so we try to balance, basically, the, uh, the genes where we expect to have uh, variants that predispose to disease versus the genes that would contain somatic um, mutations that we need to identify and uh, look for cancer drivers or signs 
uh, of cancer or cancer signatures. It will, it's a compromise. Sure. Sure. Okay, uh, that was fantastic. Um, Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Ragusis, would either of you have any final comments for the audience? No, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to present our work um, and for the support uh, to help us develop a test which we believe will change our lives. Thank you. Also, like to thank the organizers. And if there are further questions from the audience, this can be sent, uh, particularly related to the assay itself. And we would be happy to answer it ASAP. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for your time and for this really, I think, really important research. Um, also want to thank uh, Lab Roots for for uh, for hosting uh, this educational event. And most especially before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and, and the great discussion and, and engagement. Um, for those questions we didn't get a chance to answer today um, or that will be submitted if you want to go back and watch it on demand, we uh, will try and address those via the contact information that you uh, gave us when you registered. Uh, this webinar will be uh, available to view on demand. Uh, Labroots will alert you via email when it's ready for replay. We encourage you to share that with your colleagues who might not have been able to log on to today's live event. And with that, I will wish you well. And until next time, goodbye.